Good afternoon. My name is Reba Nance, and I'm the Director of Law Practice Management and Risk Management for the Colorado Bar Association. It's my pleasure today to welcome you to the program on Introduction to Legal Project Management. We're thrilled to have Mark Lassiter. Um, Mark is an expert on this area. He's spoken in Colorado before, and we're very fortunate to be able to have him. I'm going to go ahead and let him introduce himself, and I want to also extend a welcome to those of you who are on the webinar. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you, Reba. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Lassiter. Just a quick word about me, because I really want to move into our program today. But for some of you who are probably wondering, why should I be listening to you? Let me give you a little bit of a background of myself. I'm an attorney of 30 years experience. I'm an AV rated lawyer. I practiced exclusively in the areas of business, real estate, and construction law for trades, businesses, and professions for the last 30 years. I'm an arbitrator for the last 20 years with the American Arbitration Association, and I serve on its commercial construction and large and complex case panels as a judge. I also serve with the National Academy of Distinguished Neutrals as both an arbitrator and a mediator as well. Um, I'm very active with the law practice section of the American Bar Association. I am the chair of the cloud computing and law practice management section of the Technology Committee of the Arizona State Bar. And I have talked and lectured all over the country on computer-aided evidence presentation and case management, which kind of brings us to our topic today, which is an introduction to legal project management and thinking strategically about legal services deliveries in the 21st century. My goal today is I want to give a practical course for you all to infuse you with sufficient theory to start rethinking the way that legal services are delivered. I can't remember who said it, but one of my favorite quotes is, there's nothing as practical as a good theory. And a good theory then becomes the framework or the paradigm through everything else uh, you know, that you, you do kind of siphons or funnels through a worldview or a theory. And I want to infuse that in today's program with you. I also want to explain a very simple legal project management life cycle and give a very simple hypothetical to illustrate this in practice. I'm going to make some assumptions for purposes of our program today that you get some stuff. If you don't get this, you'll still get value out of the course, but you'll get a lot more if you are kind of uh, understand that some major shifts have occurred. And that is, law has irreversibly changed forever since the 2008 Great Recession. It's as though somebody hit Control-Alt-Delete in 2008 with the Great Recession coming on and the fall of Shearson Lehman Brothers and American and worldwide capital markets and things like that. It is an entirely new ballgame in the practice of law since the last five years. Uh, law is moving at least in the commercial realm, but I would also argue in the area of consumer law as well. It is moving irreversibly, uh, slowly albeit, but irreversibly nonetheless, towards alternative fee arrangements and fixed price billings, so-called value billings arrangements. And it, the, really, the essence of today's course is this. You cannot make the transition or the move from hourly-based billing to value-based alternative fee arrangements that are based on fixed prices for complex commercial uh, litigation and transaction matters unless you embrace project management and process management. If you don't do that, you are a suicide pricing waiting to happen. I mean, for those of us who've represented contractors, sooner or later you represent a contractor who underbids a job, and sometimes it puts them out of business. Uh, but lawyers right now are in the danger of doing that because where clients are demanding that we give them alternative fees, but we do not have the tools or the means or the methods to be able to give fixed price bids in a way that takes into account our cost structures and our profit models, it's an accident waiting to happen. In other words, value billing and alternative fee arrangements are the tail that is wagging the dog on this new and emerging field of legal project management. If you don't understand these things, you're either completely clueless and fell off the turnip truck, or you're in denial, but either way you're screwed. So I think this program will help those of you that are trying to make that transition. For those of you that are not persuaded that we're really going through a change, I gave a talk uh, as a, one of the keynote speakers this summer to the Colorado State Bar Board of Governors meeting in May. And that talk called Sea Change Inside the Changing Legal Marketplace is available as a video for you to watch. It's about an hour's presentation. You 
can watch it on the weekend doing dishes, uh, you know, at your kitchen or something like that. But I think it would be a useful point of departure for those of you that are still skeptical about the notion that any change is really going on in our profession. Now, what I want you to know today is that you may not know or adequately appreciate it, but when we talk about the shift or the move to alternative legal services delivery models and legal project management, so the thing to understand is that the biggest hurdles to implementing it are cultural, not technical. Well, a lot of people think, oh, well, we'll just get new software or new technology and that'll solve the problem. No, it won't. Uh, if you get new technology but the culture doesn't change, you're not gonna be helping yourself at all. You're just gonna be hurting yourself. Um, when you take legal project management and value billing together, the reason that there is a cultural problem is that these two things in tandem could ultimately spell the demise of the traditional 20th century pyramid type law firm, which are run by equity partners who are so vested in the past that they really don't have an incentive uh, at this point to make a change. And I'm speaking now to that generation of partners in their late 50s, 60s, 70s. You know, they may be talking about change, but they can probably ride it out for the next five to 10 years until they retire. But how they leave the firm following their retirement is really the next generation issue. And that's to that generation that I'm speaking today because it's hard to get an old dog to do new tricks. And it's going to be very hard to get the cultural changes among the senior equity partners. And this is why, frankly, just a lot of lawyers right now that are in their 40s and stuff like that are just bailing because they don't really have um, a conviction that their law firm partners understand the changes that are going on or will execute those changes early enough for it to be a benefit to them. Um, so let's talk about briefly, what do I mean by this 20th century, latter 20th century pyramid model? Well, it starts with some kind of a rock star, hotshot trial lawyer. You know, we. We're a cult of celebrities, at least among the, uh, the trial lawyers of the world. And that person will bring along two or three associates from their existing firm. They'll get some support staff and paralegals or junior associates. Over time, people move up the ladder and other people come down the bottom. Same thing happens with the administrative capabilities of the firm. It goes from just a receptionist in a small firm that answers phones and opens mail to the mail room and related things like that. And this is where you get what I call the latter 20th century pyramid model. Add to that your class A office space and what you have is a huge overhead footprint. Really, really gigantic overhead footprint. In fact, the average in a, in a metropolitan area, the average overhead per lawyer in any firm before a dime of compensation or benefits is paid to the lawyer is about $15,000 a month plus or minus $3,000. That's the average cost. So very high overhead footprints historically for the practice of law. Now, what is driving legal project management? You hear a lot of the term legal project management today. It's something of a buzzword. But the person or persons that is the most influential in the last five years in pushing this has been the Association of Corporate Counsel, or what's sometimes referred to as the ACC. The ACC is the largest trade association of in-house lawyers in the world. It has some 30,000 members, 20,000 of whom are here in the United States. You cannot even join this distinguished club unless you're an in-house lawyer. If you're in a law firm that's outside, you can't get in unless you pay as a vendor to come in and present to their events. But what happened is after the Great Recession kicked in, the first people to feel your pain were the people that were actually getting their budgets cut. And this was the in-house general counsel. Microsoft had its worldwide legal spend cut by one third over a two year period between of 2008 and 2010. They used to have 35 firms uh, outside counsel representing them. They shaved it down to five law firms and shifted the balance of their work to legal process outsourcing companies. So the ACC is the one, it's general counsel, it's members are the ones that are pushing this move through what's known as their value challenge, the ACC value challenge. And one of the resources I'd strongly encourage you to go to is their website, the ACC value challenge. And what that's described as is the ACC's initiative to reconnect the value and cost of legal services. And implicit in this is the idea that the billable hour is no longer a relative measure for uh, what things 
the value of legal services. In other words, just because somebody arbitrarily charges X amount of dollars per hour, spends X amount of hours to do something, doesn't mean that at the end of the day, the, the product of those two numbers is the value proposition for that company. And what you started to see now is, when they started pushing the value challenge for the first time, you start seeing the corporate council is actively looking to see what are the project management tools and processes that law firms have in place to assure that if they give us a fixed price bid, we're going to get a fixed price bill at the end of the work that's being done. So law pra or legal project management is all about value. But most important, it's about value as it is singularly defined, not by the law firm, not by the lawyer doing the work. It is value as it is defined by the customer or by the client. And we recognize now that the sole arbiter and determiner of what is value is the client. And that law firms cannot just arbitrarily bill so many hours times X amount of rate and then try to foist upon the client this unilateral determination of value based on that hourly uh, methodology, uh, the clients are rather the ones to say, no, this job isn't worth more than X to me. Will you do it for that much and take on all the risk and responsibility for doing so? Now, in effect, what do we mean by value? Well, a really quick, cheap definition of value is clients want it better, faster, cheaper. That's really a good layperson's definition right now of what's going on. Clients want legal services done better, faster, cheaper. But law firms are constrained in doing that by three things, our people, our processes, and our technology. And what's interesting is there is a correlation between better, faster, cheaper, and a law firm's people, processes, and technology. And what do I mean by that? Well, the correlation is this. If you take the value proposition to mean better, faster, and cheaper, and then you layer on top of that your processes, your technology, and your people, you have a relationship in that if you want to have better legal work done, better will be done in accordance with the processes that the law firm has in place. So there is a correlation between better services and the processes that the service itself um, uh, is created by. Second, if you want it faster, you have to leverage and rely upon technology. So there's a correlation between getting it faster and whether or not the firm has adequate technology in place to do that. And most important, and this is where it starts getting hard as we'll see, and this is where the culture rubber meets the road. If you want the legal services delivered cheaper, the only way you can do that is you can cut or control or eliminate people. Now, this is not popular if you're a first-year lawyer or a law student because you're already seeing in the current marketplace the implications of this. But the only way to control costs uh, in law firms who historically have always just thrown people at problems and billed for them by the hour, thus rendering out of control legal costs, the only way to do that is to eliminate people. But to eliminate people, in turn, means that you have to delegate more to technology and you have to have more efficient processes to do that. Now, another way to look at value is from a value engineering perspective. So I went to the ACC Value Challenge Gosh, it was three years ago this coming May in Chicago. And all the usual suspects there that you read about were our faculty for that invitation-only event in Chicago. You had Pamela Waldow and Doug Richardson, who just came out last month with their book, uh, Legal Project Management and One Hour for Lawyers by the American Bar Association. You had Patrick Lamb of Ad Valorem Group, who's been written and is coming out with other books with the ABA and has written books on alternative fee arrangements and value billing for the ARC Group and things like that. So you had all this faculty of rock stars that are in the legal project management movement. And I came back right after that, realizing the shift that was going on, and I enrolled in a master's degree program in project management at Northern Arizona University. And last summer, I finished my last upper level course at that thing on value engineering. And at first, I didn't know what value engineering was, and I really didn't want to take the class because I just wanted to study project management. But it turned out maybe to be the most significant of all of the program classes I took. And here's a definition of value engineering. It's analyzing the functions of systems and services for the purpose of achieving the essential fun functions at the lowest life cycle cost. So just like you're used to 
Einstein's theory of relativity E equals MC squared. Are there formulas that you apply in physics to understand physics and things like that? There are two different key concepts or definitions in value engineering. And the first one is this. All cost is for function. Now I want to say that again because it's really important and it's very counterintuitive and most of you in the audience, if you're a lawyer like me, are going to ha have the same reaction I had and that is, I disagree. Well, you could disagree if you want to, but I'm going to persuade you, I hope, why it's still true. All cost is for function, okay? Now, that value engineering arose out of World War II when there was a shortages of products. So when there was no rubber, you couldn't make rubber washers to make dishwashers. So you had to think of alternative types of materials to be able to make a dishwasher if you couldn't get rubber because it was all going to put on army half tracks and vehicles and tanks and things like that. So value engineering looks at what's the function of the washer and does it have to be rubber or could it be plastic or could it be felt or some other kind of a material. So the theory there is all cost is for function but it arose in the context of the manufacturing industrial base. Does it really apply to cost? Well. At first I thought no, but the more I thought about it, I thought no, yes it does. Because when clients come to me, here's what they're really asking. Mark, I have this presenting problem. What do I do? Right? That's what the clients are always asking. What do I do? Do is a verb that connotes action. And action is what we take to solve a problem, which is precisely what function is. So when a client comes to me and I say, let's send a demand letter, I am describing and recommending to the client what function they should undertake to try to get a certain kind of result. If I say that if the demand letter doesn't work, we'll file a demand for arbitration or a lawsuit, I'm describing another kind of function. So there's a sense about what we, what we as lawyers do, among other things, is we give advice or counsel about what functions ought to be undertaken in the professional services realm in which we have expertise. The second one then is this, value from a value engineering point of view means function divided by cost. So let me give you an example. Most people would agree that an iPhone or an Android phone or something like that is a good value because you can buy the phone and you can download hundreds of free apps. You can download games, you can download calendaring and scheduling things at no additional cost. So the bottom line is you have one element of cost, but you have lots and lots and lots and lots of functions. And the more function that you have for the cost that you paid equals a greater value. Well, this is now how outside counsel and clients are starting to analyze legal services. Not in terms of, oh, Thurston Howell the third is our trial lawyer. He or she is a rock star kind of a thing, all right? Clients are less concerned by that because 95% of civil cases are going to settle and never go to trial anyway. What clients are increasingly concerned about is what functions will this law firm perform and how much will they have to charge to get to the point where we know how to do a resolution or a settlement of the matter. Now, the only definition I would change in the service industry is the idea that if you want to have an impact as a law firm, you have to add the element of impact. In other words, clients aren't just paying us to go through a checklist. We've got to get results. And that is a little bit more of a subjective function than just the objective definition I gave you. But the bottom line is more and more law firms need to be thinking in terms of process improvement and project improvement. So for example, if you look at a FAST diagram or a function analysis system technique, this is one that I did just for a conflict of interest process. I'll blow up the process here. But more and more people are thinking about processes within a firm in terms of what are the incremental steps that we need to take. They're applying Six Sigma or Lean Six Sigma technologies or methodologies to try to find efficiencies, to look at our processes, figure out where can we shave time, where are we being inefficient, how can we do this better, faster, cheaper, et cetera. And all of this is being done as part of a value engineering process improvement methodology. And what becomes important then is when you take those various steps and you now put them into a project plan, you have what is called a work breakdown structure. We're going to talk about this a little bit more. But often a project plan simply translates those processes that you took the time to went, go through and put it into a time phase, budgeted, organized, sequenced action plan. Now, I'm still making the case right now for project management notice, and we haven't gotten into it yet. But I want to show a couple of things here that are really important. 
There are two surveys uh, that I watch every year that come out that are fascinating. One is the Altman Wheel Annual Chief Legal Officer Survey. What this is is the results from the 2012, year before last, Altman Wheel Chief Legal Officer Survey. By the way, I recommend you go to the Altman Wheel website. You can sign up for these and they'll automatically email them to you when and as they come out with them every year. And it's really a really useful source of info. But notice in 2012, the, the most important thing that outside lawyers in general counsel and chief legal officers and corporations wanted was they wanted greater cost reduction. That was the number one tail wagging the dog. And notice that number two was more efficient project management. Okay, this is what the surveys are saying. We want more efficient project management. Now, some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, Mark, you said that was number two. Why is that? Well, if you look, number two, uh, was based on 53% as was number three. So it was arbitrary that the third item here got put third instead of second. But in any event, they're all kind of tied into this non-hourly based pricing structure, which you can't even do without legal project management. So two years ago, the most Im second most important thing after cost reduction was does our outside counsel have legal project management capabilities? Now, look at the 2013 survey just came out two months ago. Notice again, that the number one thing is now improved budget forecasting. And number three, this time without question, number three is more efficient project management. Okay, It's not even number two anymore. But what I want to argue, notice in the yellow there that I've highlighted a number of things in yellow. What I want to make the argument for is that contrary to the suggestion that this data suggests that legal project management is now less important than it was two years ago, I want to make the case that it's more important than ever. And it all comes down to look at the three or the, the six highlighted yellow things here. And let's talk about what does it mean? They talk about improved budget forecasting, greater cost reduction, more efficient project management, improved communications, alternative project staffing, preventative loss strategies. Do those have anything whatsoever to do with legal project management? Well, for us to understand that, let's look at two things. This is the Project Management Institute's body of knowledge, and it identifies knowledge areas and process groups. And so the process groups and the knowledge areas, I want to take those and juxtapose them to what the survey that Altman Will conducted in 2013 said. And look at the correlations here. When you talk about improved budget forecasting as being important to general counsel in that 2013 survey, it directly corresponds to project scope management and project time management, which are part and parcel of project management period. Greater cost reduction corresponds to project cost management knowledge areas of project management. Alternative staffing goes to project human resource management and how and whether you're going to outsource or use people within your company to do that. What about improved communications? Well, that all comes down to the project communication management body of knowledge in that. And finally, alternative project staffing goes to project procurement and preventative loss strategies is simply another term for risk management. So contrary to what an uninformed reader would think about looking at the 2013 survey, when you actually align what outside counsel is looking for to the recognized steps and disciplines in project management bodies of knowledge, they are screaming and crying more than ever for project management to be actively inculcated into the cultures of the outside law firms that they're hiring. And all of that boils down to more efficient project management. Uh, take a look at a totally separate survey of the top 1,000 global companies in the world and notice that the quality of project management is vital. It's considered essential by 60% of outside counsel as to whether or not they will hire law firms is whether those law firms have in place an existing culture and capability to do legal project management. Now, this brings us really to the whole subject. And I'm going to blow through some of these slides. We're not going to be able to get through all of them. But I want you to notice that, that Richard Susskind, in his book that was just released a year ago this month called Tomorrow's Lawyers, really a must read for anybody who is an attorney that plans to be practicing law for the next 10 years. It's really an outstanding book, and Susskind is kind of a, those of us in the legal uh, law practice management community and in the legal project management community see him as kind of a guru in his own right. We're kind of all disciples one way or the other of this guy. But he talks about 
legal services is being supported by smart systems and standard processes, and that these are going to be playing an, a more important role in the practice of law in the future. And he identifies eight new jobs for lawyers. And what's interesting to me about this is if you look at these eight new jobs for lawyers, notice that it talks about the legal process analyst and the legal project manager right there in the beginning. The reason I highlight this to you is what he is in effect saying is that in the current marketplace today, there are new types of law practices, substantive disciplines that are now emerging in the practice of law for lawyers to begin practicing and specializing in that never existed before. All of us have heard of the IP lawyer, right? Or the real estate lawyer, or the employment lawyer. We've heard about those since whenever we went to law school. But now you're starting to hear about lawyers who specialize as legal process analysts, or legal project managers, or legal risk managers. These are eight new areas of practice of law. So if you're a young lawyer and you're like, well, in the game of musical chairs, there's no more chairs for me to sit down in because all the older lawyers have done that. Well, pull up your own new chair in one of these new eight emerging fields, and one of them is, in a very big way, legal project management. I'm going to move forward on some of these slides. My own company, Lex Projects, uh, which is a non-law firm firm, uh, I formed for this very purpose, is to actually put together processes and systems and methodologies and checklists and things like that, um, precisely to embrace, in effect, I've appropriated Susskind's ideas in his book for my own professional development on a go-forward basis in the next few years. Um, so let's move forward now and look at a simple project management life cycle and what that looks like. Now, the essence of legal project management can all boi be boiled down into one word, and that's this. Plan the work, and then work the plan. That's legal project management in a nutshell. Plan the work ahead, and then work the plan. But nonetheless, there is a life cycle, so to speak. And I'm going to go through that quickly. And we're going to spend a little more time on some of these things than on others. But all of them will be useful. And I have some other resources that will be attached to your downloadable PDF materials that will help you with this. First of all, set clear goals with the client. Um, this may seem obvious. It's not. It's not. OK, I can say that for myself. There is a tendency when you bill hourly to just start the clock in the meter and start driving the cab without really thinking, uh, where am I going here? Is that road closed? Is there a detour? What's the quickest way to get there, et cetera? But getting and setting clear client goals requires understanding issues, interests, assumptions, requirements, the scope of the project, and how much the client can afford to pay. Second, once you've carefully gotten and set the client's goals, determine what actual and precise tasks have to be performed. And there are different ways to do that that we'll talk about. You can determine and decompose the deliverables. You can make a checklist or a work breakdown structure, the like. Next, schedule the actual tasks that you've determined have to be done. And you have to order and sequence those in the right order to do that. Next, resource those tasks initially to generic resources for purposes of budgeting and figuring out estimates of work duration and the like. Next, do your estimate, do your budget, run it by the client. You may be doing top-down planning, bottom-up planning, et cetera. This raises the idea of the scope schedule cost quality equilibrium that we'll talk about a little bit also. After you've figured out what the client can afford to pay or will pay, then and only then do you make your assignment of the task to the actual people that were performed the work who may or may not be in your law firm. Ooh, there's a culture clash. We'll talk more about that later on. You want to next identify and assess the risks that are involved and plan for that appropriately. You want to monitor and manage the changes. You want to uh, manage the stakeholder communications and expectations. We're actually going to blow through very quickly items 7, 8, and 9. Uh, they're kind of beyond uh, the scope of doing a detailed analysis of those here, but we'll mention them enough that you know that it's in the mix. And then finally, doing after action or preparing knowledge management uh, capabilities for this is important. So let's start with getting and setting clear goals. Here's really the problem. Most lawyers approach legal work with a strong desire to please the client by jumping on it right away. Sir, we're going to get on this right away. We're going to jump on this matter, et cetera. The problem is for a lot of lawyers is that they approach it with a great sense of urgency, but not with a tremendous degree of foresight or planning. And this is what I call the ready-fire-aim ready approach. 
The problem with this approach is it's going to backfire because you kind of get this keystone cop, you know, kind of a thing where you get people out there and they're frenetically moving around the stage and they're doing a lot of activity, but you don't really know what they're getting done or accomplishing with that. So that's the problem with the ready, fire, aim approach. When I say to get set clear client goals, what I mean is to start off very carefully targeting what are the exact and precise issues that are present here. What are the interests of the client? Uh, let me just stop here and give you an example. What if a client came to you with a patent infringement lawsuit and they said, I've just been sued for a patent infringement case. We really need you to settle this as quick as possible. And that's all the client said. Is that, enough money, is that enough information to really diagnose the nature and extent of the client's problem or what the alternative fee arrangement should be if you're not doing it on an hourly basis? Maybe, maybe not. I don't think it is. But what if after further communications you discovered from this client that they've already lined up venture capital, that they're ready to take their company private in a $20 million um, uh, initial public offering, and that if they don't get rid of this case within four months, the capital funding and underwriting sources are going to pull the thing and they won't be able to go public. And by the way, the executive that's talking to you, his or her net worth will be diminished by about $2 million in that scenario. Now you have data to understand the interests that are the tail wagging the dog. You have the idea of what value it is to this customer and what an alternative fee might be. But if you don't really probe and ask more questions than what most lawyers are used to, you're going to miss that. What are the assumptions? In my firm, it's just a mantra in my firm, if you work for me, assumption is the mother of all screw-ups. And so we are constantly questioning, what are we assuming here? What have we not checked? What have we not verified? What's the scope of this project? Scope is the huge one. I was hired a year and a half ago as an expert witness. Quick fact pattern, true story. Big law firm, big law firm, national law firm, uh, was hired to collect a $6 million deficiency on a commercial loan transaction on a commercial real estate development gone south in the Phoenix area. They were going to go in and foreclose on the property and seek a deficiency against the guarantors and the business entity itself. And when they went in, the lender, a large national bank, said, we want a fixed price on what you're going to do here. And the law firm quoted them a flat fee of $45,000 to get a deficiency judgment. Now, I was brought in as an expert after that law firm sued the client for $540,000 in unpaid legal fees. The client had already paid 150 grand, which was three times the amount of the fee that had been quoted to them to do the work. And I was called in because of my expertise in prejudgment asset seizures, and I was, in effect, there to testify that although if they would have done it properly, it could have been done for $45,000, they didn't. But here was the problem. This law firm is in the state bar of Arizona court arguing a fee thing, and now they have an ethics problem because if they've charged the client an excessive fee, this national firm can get disciplined against the lawyers there for having charged an excessive fee. What was the problem in this whole case? The lawyer threw out the number 45,000, and what did the client hear? The client heard, oh, you're going to take this case from start to finish, including appeals all the way to the US Supreme Court for $45,000 inclusive of attorney's fees, costs, and expenses. That's what the client heard. But the lawyer never scoped out what the lawyer was going to do. And because the lawyer did not scope it out and present precisely what the scope of work was going to be, the client heard, you'll do everything that needs to be done for this case. And the case expanded with unexpected counterclaims and things like that. My point is, you have to no longer leave it to supposition. You have to clearly identify the scope of work, the risks, the constraints, and most important, the budget. And nowadays, I start, and I actually work backwards. I ask the client, how much good money are you willing to spend to chase out this unpaid commercial collections debt? So I work backwards. And a lot of times, how the client will tell you that is very telling. You know, if, they, if they've got a $6 million deficiency and say, I don't want to spend more than a quarter million dollars on this. 
that's going to influence your strategy, your scope, and how you staff the project, uh, as opposed to what we used to do, and that is, well, give me a $50,000 retainer, I'll start billing against that hourly, and you never had to deal with these issues before. So getting and setting clear goals are important. There's a really, really good resource that I recommend that you go to. Go to the acc.com website, go to Value Challenge, and download a resource called Managing Outside Counsel, a checklist of conversations. These are free resources. There are lots of other ones. But I love this checklist of conversations because it gets to so many different ways to interview a client and really come to clear terms to understand their goals, their assumptions, and not leave these things to guesswork. That's really the critical factor here. Second, determine what tasks you have to do. And I'm going to give you four quick tips on how to do that. First of all, develop checklists. Uh, second of all, determine and decompose the deliverables. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Next, look for organizational process assets. This is simply other things that your firm has put into place. Your firm may have checklists. Your firm may have um, uh, resources that they use when putting this together. And nowadays, you can go and buy a lot of these things from LexisNexis or Practical Law Company or the state bars, things like that, will often have these resources. Now, when I say checklist, almost everybody who's been practicing law in some specific area has got checklists. So these become very important for defining the scope of work and figuring out what has to do. Another thing, though, is what's called decomposing the deliverables. So if you know you're going to be preparing a real estate contract, just go through the contract with a yellow highlighter and highlight each of the bits of information that you need. If you were using document assembly software to put together a uh, uh, documents in your firm, you would have to be doing this by decomposing the deliverables. But this will give you the fields of information that you need and in turn the tasks that need to be undertaken to get what you need. You can often get these things from vendor checklists such as formation of a corporation checklist or mergers and acquisitions checklist. So you can get these uh, task items from other things. And when you get all those together, you create what's known as a work breakdown structure. And a work breakdown structure is kind of like a checklist on steroids. A checklist is kind of like a to-do list, but a work breakdown structure is not only a to-do list, but it's phased with how much something's going to cost, how much effort it's going to take, how long it's going to take, what the amount is, who's going to do it, etc. So when you get that work breakdown structure, what you then are doing is taking all of the to-do things and putting it into a, an, a structure shown here in a Microsoft Project 2010 environment, but that's how you start putting together your Gantt chart and your work breakdown structure for that. And notice that you can often take things and for each of those tasks you can attach a memo. And if you do that, you'll actually have like a little checklist within a checklist. So you might have, for example, conduct a conflict of interest search, and then you might have an attached memo that actually tells you the different steps that you have to do to properly do that one item on the, on the work breakdown structure correctly. So that's kind of getting into the element of requirements and so forth for that. Next, you want to schedule the tasks. And scheduling tasks just simply means once you know what they are, assigning that. And usually, you want to do it with generic people first, like paralegal, senior lawyer, partner level, junior associate, file clerk, something like that at a generic level. You want to then make your generic resource assignments and tasks and do this with generic or shadow resources for planning purposes. This is what I meant by saying assign it to a paralegal instead of to John, Bill, or Cindy who are the paralegals in your firm or in your department. Start generically for the reasons I'm going to show you in a minute here. And that's what you get when you put together the plan initially is the generic resources that are showing up on the work breakdown structure. Now, when it comes to resourcing, there's something very important you need to understand. Unless your firm has embraced or adopted technology that tells you how much the people in your firm are already working on other things, this is a disaster. Okay. In other words, and this is the biggest problem I've seen in law firms that try to do this, because they have absolutely no clue how much other stuff is getting delegated to the associates, paralegals, and other staff in their firm or junior partners, they don't really know. I was, <laughs> I was the chair of the commercial litigation and dispute resolution practice group of a 60-lawyer law firm with regional offices in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And we had four paralegals and about nine lawyers in my group and so forth. And there was this one paralegal that was so good 
that all of the lawyers dumped work on her unbeknownst to the others and didn't tend to give it to the other three paralegals. And none of the lawyers, just like the left hand, didn't know what the right hand was doing. And this one paralegal that was getting all the work was admittedly good, but was on the border of a nervous breakdown just because nobody knew that they should be allocating work differently. They all wanted to go to the rock star paralegal. But if you're not managing which work is getting given to whom, you cannot level or equalize the workflow to make sure that there's not bottlenecks in the work or that you're freaking out uh, some of your staff. Um, Without having some way of managing this, and I'm going to show you some capabilities, uh, your assumed resources will not be there. And after running the plan by the client for getting approval, then you want to only uh, assign your final resources. And often it's best to use these generic resources. Now here's an example of a resource that you can use with a heat map. And what I want to show you here is notice how that it's assigning work. You can see the resources there off to the left. But when it's red, it means that those people are over allocated. It means other people in the firm have already given them too much work. And so we need to reassign some of the work to the people that have the red areas to the people in the green so that we can level the resources or equalize the resources and not be um, overutilizing some and underutilizing others. You see this, by the way, in Microsoft Project. When you see those little red icon people in Microsoft Project, that means that that person is over allocated and already has too much work and you should reassign uh, or level the task to them. Now next, you do an estimate of cost and you do a budget. Now notice, we're only halfway through the cycle right now. We're three quarters of the way through this program. No work's even been done and we don't even have a budget yet, okay? This is showing you how much Legal project management requires upfront planning. Most of the work is actually going to be done in the planning because once you know what has to be done, doing the work is a relatively easy thing, especially if you're using document assembly systems or stuff like that. Um, but the important thing here is don't rush the work. Make sure you plan the work before you start doing it. But now is where you're also going to see the culture clash. And you're going to see this in a video that I prepared here. But the important takeaway is this. If you're using alternative fee arrangements or value-based billing arrangements that are based on fixed prices for complex commercial and transaction and litigation matters, don't rush the process until you've made sure that you have a plan and a resource and a cost thing. Again, there's this tendency, the client's always saying, you gotta get on this, what's it gonna cost, what's it gonna cost? Avoid the temptation to throw out any number because whatever number you have will be etched and seared irreversibly on the client's mind, just like that 45,000 for that $6 million deficiency collection. You don't wanna go there. Now, briefly, top-down planning is what's used by management in budgeting, and it often has no rational relation to what something actually costs to do. An example of that is somebody says, well, in the legal department this year, we're gonna assign $1 million to handle all of the employment matters that come up on all five continents for our global international company, and that's it. That's top-down planning, okay? It's often a pipe dream, admittedly, but that's the way that people do that. Bottoms-up planning is a little more specific and more like what we've been talking about. That's a clear identification of the scope of work, the tasks, who's going to do it. You tend to go and talk to the people in the line and say, how long is it going to take you to do this or that? What do you think it's going to cost, et cetera? That's bottom-up planning. And this raises what's known as the scope, schedule, cost, quality equilibrium. And I want to take a minute and talk about this because most lawyers are already doing this. It's just they've never known what they were doing and been able to articulate it before. So here's the idea behind the scope, schedule, cost, quality, equilibrium. And that says that in any project or program, you have these conflicting ideals and that they're always interacting with each other, kind of like a Rubik's Cube. You know, you, you, you can change the one dimension, but if you change the one, it does impact the other, just like a Rubik's Cube would. So, for example, and, and by the way, when I talk about these, when you see the brackets that are showing the length or duration, <coughs> if you see a short bracket, it means less time or a shorter time or less effort or whatever. And when you see a longer bracket, it means more time or a longer period of time or more work or something like that. So let me give you an example. Suppose you have a temporary restraining order on an unfair competition case involving a trade secret. You have a very short period of time shown here by the short schedule in the small font. You've got to do very high quality work because this injunction, the whole case is gonna rise and fall on whether you get this injunction. So the quality of your work has got to be outstanding. 
You've got a lot of things to do before you can do this, so your scope is big. You've got to get affidavits from four different people. You've got to get an affidavit from an expert. You've got to hire an expert. You've got forensic discovery issues for electronic evidence discovery and electronically stored information to show that the ex-employee took the files or misappropriated the trade secrets. When you have all that kind of stuff, short period of time, lots of work, high quality, your cost, is huge, right? Anybody who's ever done an injunction like that, that's premium dollar work for any law firm to do that. Now let's suppose a different scenario. Let's suppose now that you're representing a defendant in a collections lawsuit and they know they owe the money and they have every intention of paying it, but they've been waiting to collect a receivable that's gonna come in in six months. They're confident that's gonna happen. So now the strategy is, I've got to play the four corners stall game, just like in a basketball game. I've got to stall this case out in court for six months until I collect that receivable, then I can pay them. So the client doesn't have a lot of money, so their budget for the cost is really low, right? That's why the cost font is so small here. The scope of work isn't really that much. The key here is they've got to drag out the schedule for as long as they can, and they don't have to have high quality legal work. Now, I want to be clear about this. I am never, when I talk about quality, assuming a situation where you will do quality work that is below the legal standard of care. Never. So I'm assuming that whatever the quote unquote quality of the work is, it will always fall within the parameters of um, standard of care within the legal profession. But the fact of the matter is, we've all seen high quality legal work and low quality legal work. The clients seldom notice the difference and the judges often don't either. So, uh, so this is a situation now where the client is coming to you saying, I don't have a lot of money, try to put off the discovery, try to stall this, let's talk about a mediation, something so that I can buy time to collect this receivable and then I can pay this off and we settle the matter. So these are just two of a countless numbers of costs uh, scheduled, cost quality equilibrium things. Now, let me show you in a live video that I recorded how these things all come to play and how they impact and affect the culture. So watch this video for the next 10 minutes. You'll find it very, very interesting. Okay, let's take a quick look at a demonstration of what we're talking about here with respect to the uh, scope schedule cost quality equilibrium that we were just talking about earlier and how this intersects with the practice of project management and the cultural shifts that it may demand in order to move to it. So what we have here is a hypothetical uh, work breakdown structure and project plan for a very simple legal project. You'll notice here that there are three highlighted groups, groups A, B, and C that are highlighted. These are the summary tasks. And the summary tasks are just like chapter marks for the actual nine tasks that are involved here in this case, each one taking 10 hours and each one being performed by either a single senior associate attorney of six to 10 years experience or a firm paralegal. And notice that both of those are generic resources. That is, in putting together the plan, we assign generic resources to say, okay, we think for these types of tasks, the reasonable resourcing or tasking or staffing uh, for a work assignment would be someone with these requisite skills. And the lawyer's billing at 250 an hour, so uh, you multiply that by 10 hours, and the paralegal is billing at $120 in this hypothetical case. Notice that this is a waterfall project management plan, and the reason for that is all of these tasks are in what's known as a finish to start dependency, and that will create over here, a waterfall effect, kind of a step-down effect, if you will, whereas each task doesn't begin to commence for completion or performance until the predecessor task is finished, etc. And that's how you get what's sometimes referred to as this waterfall uh, structure, common in uh, real estate, mergers and acquisitions, transactions, or entity formations, not so common in litigation where you use other kinds of methods quite often. Now, what you notice here then is we have 90 hours of work at these varying rates for a sum total of $16,800. Ignore this amount because this hypothetical scales. It could just as easily be $168,000 or $1,680,000. For purposes of our discussion, this is what we have. Now, what I want you to suppose is that we have a client for whom this um, 
project plan and work breakdown structure has been prepared. Notice, by the way, that this is what's sometimes referred to as a bottoms up plan. That means that you performed the task or you figured out what the tasks would be, you consulted with the downstream people that are actually going to do the tasks, etc. And based upon this movement of information up the stream, you come up with the price here of $16,800. And let's assume that it's a pretty accurate quote based on the constraints that you have of firm labor from W-2 employees that are uh, an attorney or a paralegal as the case may be here. Now, let's suppose though that at this point the client informs you, uh, I don't want to pay more than $10,000 for this work. Now this is where the culture clash to the traditional pyramid or even the evolving diamond shape law firm as we've seen in the last five years begins to cause a clash or a culture. Because there's really only three options when the client tells you that work that you've scoped out or that you've uh, estimated at being $16,800 says to you, I don't want to pay more than $10,000 for this. Well, you can either decline the representation, but let's assume you don't want to do that here that maybe this is Daddy Warbucks and he's giving you a problem for Little Orphan Annie, but if you do a good job, maybe you'll get all the work for all of his businesses and industries. Um, the second option you can do is yield or acquiesce to the $10,000 amount that he has said this case is worth. But the problem is a lot of lawyers that are quoting this fee have absolutely no clue what their actual cost is in performing this work or labor. This is why you're seeing the rise of pricing partners in law firms, is they are the ones at the C-level of a law firm that understand the economics of the law, but you don't always see the downstream lawyers uh, and people actually performing the work understanding what the cost structure is that's involved in the firm. So let's assume for argument's sake that the actual out-of-pocket cost for labor and overhead and things like that that would be borne by the firm would total up to $12,000. Well, in that case, the firm would be taking this on at a loss of $2,000. And let's assume that that's not acceptable. So we can't take it for 10. We'll lose money because it'll cost us 12 uh, to do this. Um, and we are constrained by the firm's current labor structure of paying people or billing out at the hour that we have <coughs> demanded for these resources. Now, it's a dilemma in this case. But let's assume that the responsible procuring partner here was not constrained by the allegiance to the firm in such a way that he or she had to use labor in the firm. Because if these tasks right here are indeed the functions to be formed, and if all cost is for function, then the client's assertion of value at $10,000 is indeed the value proposition here uh, that the firm has to satisfy. So what we can do here, if we can deviate from the historical practices, is we can now change the resources. So as you see here, we're looking now, we've gone to the resource view and to the team planner in Microsoft Project 2010 here. And what we're going to do now is we're going to find the tasks that are assigned in this case to the senior associate and in this case down below the four tasks that are assigned to the firm paralegal both the attorney and the firm paralegal being W-2 employees of the firm. But their labor costs are too high. So what if we take the same tasks that were to be performed by the senior attorney and we delegate or move these tasks to now be performed by a contract attorney, say somebody from Robert Half Legal or Special Counsel or any of the other innumerable uh, temporary legal staffing places, might even be a legal process outsourcing company. And similarly, we're going to take the paralegal tasks here and we're going to move those as well into the contract paralegal role. So now we have the same task, the same functions in the scope schedule cost quality equilibrium. We have not changed the scope of work. We still have nine tasks tasks to perform. We have not changed the schedule. Let's assume that the quality remains fixed for the reasons I'll show you in a minute. The only thing we've affected here is cost and we have done this to see if we can come up with 
a way to satisfy the client's expression of value in this case. So now having moved and shifted those tasks, we go back to the Gantt chart and lo and behold, look what we have here. We have now the same identical work being performed for $6,700 and the client's willing to pay ten grand. This is a win-win, or so it should be. The firm is making 50% on the labor arbitrage here in this case. And you would think that the firm would be absolutely delighted to know that they've delivered a good result to the client. Now let's digress for a minute. How can we assure quality if we are outsourcing work beyond the four corners of the firm? Well, this is where the whole function or idea of the legal systems engineer comes up. Because if you'll notice here, I've assigned in this work breakdown structure in the category of hyperlink, I've created now hyperlinks to the actual body of knowledge that, that in effect functions as the specifications or requirements performance consistent with which is required by anybody performing this task in order to properly complete the task just like on a construction job you have plans and specifications now we have added via hyperlink to either our own organizational process assets or to our vendor organiz or vendor process assets, in this case, the practical law company. So now if I go here and I click on this hyperlink in order to execute uh, a search, look what comes up here. I now have the practical law company uh, in this particular case and its formation checklist. And it, I'm using this strictly as a hypothetical here, but it could be any of the other resources of the practical law company or for that matter, any other vendors. So what we've been able to do is embed within the project plan itself the quality control assurances that will convince us that as long as the work is executed and the functions are executed in accordance with the requirements, that the client is going to get the same quality of value. The big question here is what to do with the allegiance to the firm which may deeply resent sending work outside of the four corners of the firm even though that is exactly what is necessary to do in order to deliver the value proposition to the client and that is where the clash of cultures arises so this is the end of this video but I hope it's been a quick and dirty but effective illustration of the culture issues that are challenging traditional pyramid and diamond shaped law firms as they embrace and adopt legal project management. Most law departments could care less because they're on the receiving end as the beneficiaries of this kind of change, but this is a change that will shake to the core, I think, many of the existing firms under the existing legal services delivery model. So this is the end of this video. All right. so. I hope that was useful. It, it's hard to bring some of these abstract concepts together unless you put it together in, in an example like that. But let's now look. So once you get the generic resources then done and you know what the plan is going to be and how much it's going to cost, now you assign the real people, not the shadow people, but the real ones that are going to do the work. But as I mentioned, the, the modern dilemma for every lawyer is going to be this. If I have a client, you know, I tell this to young lawyers. Your greatest job security as a lawyer is never the law firm or company that you work for, ever. Don't ever believe that. And don't ever let a senior partner that you work for tell you that. Your greatest job security if you are a lawyer is a satisfied book of customers that sends you repeat business and refers people to you. So your first allegiance for your own self-benefit is never your law firm, which could be here today and gone tomorrow, or that would throw you under the bus in a New York minute if they had to. But if you have customers, you will always find law firms to work for or to have your own company. You've got to keep them happy first. The question is, if generating work and using law firm resources makes it too expensive for your clients, will you outsource that work or be able to outsource that work and still supervise it to bring it in in a price point that the client is going to be happy with and continue to seek work in. I think this is going to result in the unbundling of legal services here in the 21st century. I think you're going to see lawyers that are originating or responsible lawyers delegating work, work both inside law firms and outside, whether to legal process, outsourcing companies or the like, and coordinating those as uh, teams, if you will. And this is going to be a big, uh, a big tension between of law firms and clients is clients want value they don't care who does the work they want the function because 
All cost is for function, right? That was the subject of our earlier discussion. And this is now even being written about in the literature. For example, Bruce McEwen in his book, Growth is Dead, uh, Now What? writes that in the future, one possible model will be just-in-time teams where lawyers put together for one project at a time the right uh, blend of people and processes and things to get the job done and then disperse just like uh, somebody on a Hollywood set would make a movie. Um, I've talked about this before. If you have a bunch of freelance lawyers that are a bunch of uh, veterans, if you will, from the big firms, but they got sick of the politics and went out on their own, you're going to see now the ability of sole practitioner lawyers to collaborate in temporary teams for different things, whether it's a litigation or a transaction or an EEOC proceeding or something like that. And they'll be joined together on a temporary basis uh, where you'll have some kind of a company that will oversee as a project manager their various activities and coordinate that with the outside contract labor, court reporters, vendors, things like that. So you're seeing a lot more of this in the literature right now as people are incre increasingly really questioning whether project management won't shake the culture core. Now, I'm going to blow through 7, 8, and 9 real quick. We just don't have time to do it, and I want to spend a little bit more on uh, the after-action report items. Risks and issues, forgive me, I'm going to have to blow through this. You'll see this in the materials that we're handling out. Uh, but I did want to show this. Two things you want to do when you're moving to a technology platform that can help you do some of these things is eliminate meetings, in-person meetings, and eliminate email. Too much time is spent in law firms meeting together to say, did you do what I told you to do last week? There ought to be an easier way than, to do that than a meeting or an email. And you really cannot manage um, legal projects without the right project management technology. And so, for example, here is an email that is generated daily, and it shows the actual work assignments and the active issues and risks and things that are outstanding. And you'll notice in the left column there, it's got action items or tasks and hyperlinks. If you click that hyperlink, it will actually take you to the interactive project plan. So if you had 15 different people in three different time zones working on a mergers and acquisitions thing. Each of them would get an email like this every day. They would click it. They would do the work. When they were done with the work, they would check it 100% complete. It would automatically update the whole plan, notify the next person in line that you're no longer on deck, you're up to bat, and so forth. And that's actually all done, in this case, uh, uh, through a SharePoint-based collaboration platform. So here you see all the active projects, cases, transactions. You've also got the work that each person is doing, the tasks that are being delegated to them. Uh, you can go to the resources. You can look at the issues. Notice that you don't need to have a meeting as long as the dashboard says that the item is green. But if and only if it turns red or turns yellow, and you're looking at this on your iPhone or your iPad, and you start seeing the yellow or red icons come up on the dashboard, now you know you need to have a meeting or a talk but not about every case, because if everything else is tracking because everybody's doing the work and, and putting in their work product and doing it on time, you only need to focus on the aberrations shown here in the dashboard red and yellow items. So this means less meetings and less email because you're using non-email based electronic communications to monitor your changes, to upload your documents, and to do your reports to the client and so forth. Um, we talked earlier about managing resources with heat maps. Here's another example of using a heat map to control costs. So once again, if, if the court reporting budget is going over, you'll see that in yellow, and it'll notify you in advance of that. Um, and then controlling scope is, once again, you can see from the various activities that that's going on. I'm going to skip through the communications in the interest of time, because this is a lunch program. I do note that the ABA model rules require us to keep our clients surprised, but they don't say how. So if you include your clients on the technology platform, they can go by themselves 24-7 and see the status of the case without having to phone you to do so. Um, now, the last thing I want to take time to talk about and this is important, is after action and knowledge management issues. Knowledge management is really the whole emerging field of how do we know what we know. And the important thing here is that we talked earlier about organizational process assets, which are the plans, processes, policies, procedures, knowledge bases that are used by the performing organization. And what's interesting is in his book, uh, 
uh, effective knowledge management for law firms. Matt Parsons has a really great quote, and he said, the only sustainable advantage that a law firm has comes from what it collectively knows and how it efficiently it uses what it knows and how readily it acquires and uses new knowledge. This is really the only value, among other things, to a law firm is the collective knowledge base that is there. The ability to draw upon the wisdom of prior partners and people like that that set up processes and systems and forms and things like that that are being used. So we're seeing now the rise of the knowledge worker, the modern day knowledge worker, and the traditional manual worker that was done on premises, at the office, during fixed working hours, uh, etc. is giving way to a more mobile workforce. It doesn't require you to go into the office and punch a time card. A knowledge worker can do what they do anywhere as long as they have a phone, a computer, and a wireless connection. They should be able to get the job done. And that has huge implications for how law firms of the future will have their pricing structures in terms of premises costs and things like that. Now, after action reports, this is important because this is another counter-cultural intuitive thing. I can remember when I was trying to run my commercial litigation and dispute resolution department at my last firm, I would meet regularly with my staff to do after action briefs and talk about, okay, you finally settled that one case. What was the takeaway from that case you learned? What will you never do again in your life that you learned not to do from that case? What did you learn to do? And so we would share this information in lunch meetings. And these lunch meetings, you know, if you had three or four lawyers participating and taking 10, 15 minutes each, they could go an hour and a half. Well, I started getting heat from the upper level management that, hey, these guys, uh, you know, they're not billing as many hours because you guys are talking about how to be more efficient. That's not really helping the bottom line here. And that was a cultural clash <laughs> for me because what I realized is, okay, we're never going to be attractive as a firm if we're not more efficient at what we're doing. But we're never going to become more efficient if we're strapped to a desk and have to bill by the hour 10 hours a day. We've got to somewhere along the line have the latitude to do a lessons learned after action report and talk about these various things. What happened, what was supposed to happen, what was positive and negative. Again, this is countercultural to a pyramid or diamond shape model that's built on the billable hour. Um, I'm going to let you look through the slides. The resources are there as well. And um, I guess what I'll do now is open it up to questions and answers. I hope this has been a helpful introduction. But I really want to close on this thought. Everything's moving right now, albeit slowly, but it is moving surely to more fixed prices. And this is going to change the cultures, and it's going to change the very nature of the organizations themselves as increasingly clients are looking for results and function at cost-effective prices that they can afford. And I'm curious right now uh, to see in the next five years how this plays out. I really believe that we're going to see a greater emphasis on form, functionality, process issues that lawyers just have not had to mess with too much in the past, that are, but that are going to become vital for survival in the future. So that's the end of my formal remarks. I'll open it up from either the audience, if you want to send in a question uh, via electronic means, or from anybody here in, uh, in the room as well. Yes? Mark, you got a question from the web. Um, it's, uh, it, it asks, if you do not address this in the presentation, could you please elaborate or uh, malpractice liability for outsourcing? Uh, the question uh, says, can you talk a little bit about malpractice liability for outsourcing? Uh, here's really the bottom line. The lawyer that is the responsible lawyer to oversee the litigation is responsible for the quality control of everybody doing work on the file, including the persons outsourced. So what that means is quality control, the buck is going to stop at the desk of the responsible attorney, the project manager, if you will, whether you call it that or not. But the responsible lawyer whose names are on the pleading is responsible for the quality control. What you're now starting to see is the development. And think about this. You know, we've got an, a lawyer in the audience who does a, a professional responsibility litigation. And, and the name of the game in that is uh, what's the standard of care. But there haven't been a lot of written standards of care. Think about that. How many of you have a written standard of care for how to do whatever you do as a lawyer? 99 of 100 of you don't have it. You're going to see in the next five years the emergence of written standards. They've got it in the health profession already. You know, if you get wheeled into an emergency room on a gurney, there's checklists now that to say if they present with these symptoms, do the following, execute the following tests, run the following 
you know, steps and procedures. We don't have that in law yet, but that's actually where the next phase is moving to is written nationally recognized standards of care that are put in writing. And once those are in place, it's going to make outsourcing work more fungible than ever. Uh, the big supposition now is if you hire the big firm, you pick the name, big law, whatever, that, oh, they just must have that. That's the assumption now. Now, anybody who's worked in a big law firm knows that's not really the case, but that's just the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. And, and once the curtain comes down, people are going to start realizing that it really comes down to who has the processes and systems and organizational process assets to control quality. The bottom line is, though, the lawyer that's responsible for the whole case is responsible for the outsourced work, including work in India at a legal process outsourcing company or otherwise. Other questions? Yes? Um, on that note, when you were talking about how do you control quality if you're outsourcing, and you have, well, create as much structure as you can, you have hyperlinks to checklists, to, in my mind, that still doesn't address whether the person you're outsourcing to has good analytical skills, has good thinking about you know, how do you do something. I mean, it sounds very rote, like why did I get a law degree if I could just follow all these checklists? How do you account for the quality in terms of analytical skills that you need to have in certain aspects of practicing law? Great, great question. So the question is, why bother having a law degree if at the end of the day you're going to have some rote checklist that everybody's going to do? Who needs to be a lawyer in that case anyway? Great question. And what you properly identified is the entire shift of globalization and commoditization of law. There is a great book that I would recommend everybody on this call uh, read, or in my case, I downloaded it on audible.com. So if you go to the audible.com website, you can download it. It's called The E-Myth Attorney. The E-Myth Attorney by Michael Gerber, G-E-R-B-E-R. -E I prefer to download it and listen to it as I'm driving to and from work. It's a must read, but here's what he basically argues. Now, Gerber wrote the book, The E-Myth, and later The E-Myth Revisited in the 1980s and early 2000s, respectively. And then just in the last couple of years, he's come out with The E-Myth Attorney, which is the application of his generalized principles to the practice of law specifically. But here's what he says. He says, at the end of the day, it's not about people, it's about processes. Now, this runs against the cultural grain of law firms. Because, see, when you go to a law firm nowadays, everybody wants to stand up like they're on the boardwalk, and they're the hotshot model, right, that's going to win the day, and I'm going to get the beauty contest because I'm a rock star celebrity trial lawyer, OK? You're going to see less and less of that, because so few cases go to trial. And at the end of the day, what has to be done are certain functions. And this is not ro a romanticized view. This is not the view of law you see on television that induces or entices people to go to law school. It is rather undramatic in some senses. But at a functional level, what we are seeing is the building of standardized processes. Now, these processes now, for example, at Safer Shaw or Baker Donaldson, which are really the two big law firms in the world that have so far mastered these, they are able for the moment to leverage those processes as proprietary. They're able to hold it out and say, we have developed these systems and processes, and we can guarantee that we know how to do this efficiently. Can the other law firms you're hiring not only guarantee that, but show it to you? They can do it because they've been doing it for five, six years, and they've caught the grist. Other firms are now belatedly coming into the fold, but inevitably what's going to happen is somebody's going to write a book, and they're going to publish all these standards, and these standards are going to become commonplace. And when they become a commonplace commodity, you're going to see work that used to be done by associate attorneys being done by paralegals. Okay, And this is going to clash. Where will be the place for the exercise of independent business judgment if I no longer have to exercise judgment because those people coming before me, those retired judges, those senior law partners, took and put in writing what should have been the judgment. And that's what you're seeing happen is as law becomes more systematized, processized, commoditized, the things that used to be the unspoken, unwritten um, body of knowledge that was captured in the mind of the senior partner who would tell it through folklore tables around the hypothetical campfire, you know, the war stories that we as trial lawyers thrive on, right? Who hasn't been to a happy hour and just sat there for two hours listening to war stories and not gone home happy? Well, what happens when you start to take the lessons learned from those war stories, put them in writing, make them into a written standard? 
then it's not so much the rock star, it's the record. And that's what we're starting to see now is the recordizing, the institutionalizing of the memory of senior experienced lawyers into a written record that will now become the requirements uh, for the project, if you will. Not very, not very uh, romantic, is it? Well, you can only create a checklist so far for drafting a motion for summary judgment, for example. Mm -hmm. You have to think about what are the facts in my case. I have to go research the law. Think about do these facts apply to the law? Is there some new argument I can make? Those are analytical skills. You can't make a checklist. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that a checklist or a robot for that moment will replace a lawyer. But what I am saying is that a lot of what lawyers do right now incorporates some of those things. But you're going to see, it's not like it's all going to get cast away. There's still going to be a place. Look, whether you file a summary judgment motion at all or not is a function of whether there's a tribal issue of fact. So just following the checklist is not going to do that. So there's always going to be room for that degree of independent, uh, the exercise of independent professional judgment. But all I'm saying is that a lot of what we lawyers like to do as the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain is preserve the mystique that really this is something you have to have a law degree to do. But like, I'll give you an example. This is interesting. So what I'm doing in my company right now and as part of my master's degree program is I am literally reading through the entire state and federal rules of civil procedure in the states where I'm involved. And I go through it with a highlight, and here's the questions, among others, that I ask each time I read a rule. First, does this rule require a deliverable, a form, a document that has to be filed with the court? If so, what are the component parts of that? What are the functions that I have to obtain in order to do that? Is the preparation of this form the practice of law or not? Is it the practice of law to prepare a subpoena? How about a notice of deposition? A civil cover sheet? Nobody's really answering these questions. The bar associations haven't done it. But I would argue that unless you have to attach the exercise of legal counsel and advice and independent judgment, it's not the practice of law. It's not. That's, that's correct. That's right. But on the other hand, if, you have a if the attorney made a really good checklist and recorded videos and stuff like that to tell his or her staff how to do the subpoena. So, but you see what I'm saying? You, you're identifying the gray area, and gray areas always create tensions because no lawyer wants to be the test case, right, in State Bar of Colorado versus fill in the blank. Nobody wants that role. But that's right now where law is, is in this tremendous gray area where clients just refuse to pay for the rock star mystique anymore. They want the function. You know, you could go and order a McDonald's hamburger, or you could go to Chez Melange Hamburger Shop, okay? Both the chef that's going to charge you 50 bucks for a hamburger at Chez Melange will try to convince you. My patty is phenomenal. The mayonnaise, it is custom made. You know, that's why you're paying $50 for it. But somebody who just wants a burger and fries, We'll settle for McDonald's. That's the function. And what we're seeing now is a lot of people that have really high overheads are trying to convince the client they need to spend 50 bucks for the Chez Melange hamburger, custom made, whereas a lot of people are saying, well, that's great, but I've only got the budget for the Burger King, McDonald's, jack-in-the-box kind of a thing, and I'm going to pay my money for function over some of those other attributes. And it's not pretty. It's making it hard for all of us that for years have practiced law with the Chez Melange burger model to suddenly have to rethink our delivery models to fast food. But that's where it's going, for better or for worse. Great questions, though. And it's a great, great discussion that will continue to be alive and well for the next decade, I'm sure. Other questions from anybody? If not, we'll call this a session. My name and number were on the materials. Anybody who's watching that didn't get an answer to a question and wants to call me, feel free to do so. Um, and uh, my information is right here at the top right. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at Mark E. Lassiter. And I'm writing and retweeting lots of articles and things of interest on these topics. So if any of you are uh, interested in following that, you can join me on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. It's been a great program. And it's always great to come back to Colorado and see you all. Thank you for your